Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Aliman, uh, he, him, his, and I'm the director of programs for Black and Pink. Um, and I'm really excited for everybody to join us today. Um, we know that this was uh, a last minute thing, but um, as we know in the activism world, um, you know, we have to step up and, and jump on things as they're happening. So um, today's conversation is really just going to be about court support. Um, and here in a minute, I'll have uh, David introduce um, Zyself. And uh, after that, we are just going to kind of go through um, some of the resources we've put together for you. Um, and then we will talk about some of our different experiences from some different perspectives. And uh, hopefully we will have some time for questions and answers. Um, Nikki will be monitoring those throughout. Um, so if you do have them, I think it's typically easier to put it in the question and answer section so that we can tag it. Um, so we would ask that you do that. Um, also, I just want to take a second to acknowledge that um, there's a lot happening in all of our communities um, and especially uh, for Black folks. Um, I just really am encouraging you to um, take moments to breathe um, and uh, things are moving quickly and they can feel like a lot. And so as we provide support for others, um, sometimes we forget to take that moment for ourselves. So just really encouraging folks to think about that um, as well as we go through this conversation today. Um, we've provide, we'll have a ton of information that you can look back at so you don't have to hold anything today. Um, just kind of listen and hang out and, and breathe and all of those things. So uh, David, I will let you introduce yourself and then kind of take us from there. Perfect. Well, hello, folks. I'm David. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Black and Pink. Um, my pronouns are Z, Zem, Zer. And, you know, and just to echo Andrew, I also want to actually just start off by saying to the Black people who are on the call that I see you and I hear you and I know that right now, well, no, I don't want to know. I, I kind of understand how difficult it is, um, given just the upheaval as of late, but also just just the upheaval and the trauma and the difficulties you have faced throughout your life. That's kind of, uh, it's kind of summed up and in, in recently it's, it's literally just felt like just hell and damnation lately. And I know that that is really tough and really rough on y'all. So I want um, just the black people who are watching this and who are listening to this to hold yourself with a little extra care to reach out and find support where you can within your communities. And yes, you are already doing that, but I also just want to continue encouraging that um, because I do see you, I do hear you. Um, and while I can never understand what it's like, um, I do want to do what I can to make sure that you are taken care of. Um, and that's a lot of why this toolkit has come to bear. Um, we, we pulled it together this toolkit in about 24 hours. Um, and a lot of it was because we kept seeing messages about how do I support? What do I do? How do I, you know, how do I do all this? It, especially because these protests and these uprisings that are happening um, are happening in the middle of COVID-19. And so it makes things a lot more unsettling. It makes things a lot more um, where you don't really have all the answers that you need. And so we wanted to use this toolkit to just to kind of provide people some, some direction for um, how you can, you know, navigate the current crisis and navigate what's happening um, and what may be happening in your communities. Um, and so this call is on court support. We'll have a few others on bail support, that's later. Um, and then we'll have one for advocacy. That one is specifically for white people and how white people can show up in this space and how white people can um, make room um, during this time. And then the last one we'll also be doing is on for system impacted people um, and how you can navigate um, getting involved while also keeping yourself safe while you're trying to navigate probation rules and regulations. Um, so yeah, we'll just dive in. Um, I think Nikki put in the chat um, a link to the toolkit. Um, and if you scroll down, I think it's on the fifth page where you'll see court support. Um, and so just for anyone who's listening at home, when we're talking about court support, well, this section was on court support and court watching. And those are kind of advocacy tools um, in our toolkit that, that allow us to care for the people who are getting wrapped up in the system. And we'll see this a lot more lately as people who are protesting are getting um, rounded up and arrested 
um, if they're getting thrown in jail. Um, and at some point they may possibly have to navigate going to court and going through trials or going where, you know, just being involved in the system. And so we wanted to make sure that people understood that um, court support and court watching are, you know, incredibly important tools that you can use um, to provide the support that people need who are navigating those systems. Um, it can be, it, it ranges in um, activities from providing individual case support, um, attempting to assure more a uh, transparent legal system, um, reporting on, you know, the actors in the court system, whether that's judges, that's prosecutors, um, public defenders, um, and gathering information and just attempting to guarantee some policy implementation that's inclusive, that's infirming. Um, and court support just involves us to provide support to those who are navigating it and then just allowing, you know, them to know that you care and that you're showing up for them. And you're sh also showing the system that, hey, this person is just not another, you know, spoke in the wheel. This person is somebody who has a full life, who has people who care for them, people who love them, who are supporting them, who are mobilizing. Um, and so court support is very important. And you'll see in here, like our Boston chapter, so I want to shout out our Boston chapter, because our Boston chapter has done a lot of work um, around court support, and a lot of these resources come directly from them. Um, so they are um, specifically Massachusetts-based. However, that does not mean that they cannot be applied and they cannot be adapted to where you're looking at. And one thing I also want to mention is be, because these protests right now are happening in the middle of COVID-19, what court support looks like is going to be very different depending on whether or not you have curfews, depending on whether or not you have stay at home in orders um, in effect. So a lot of this is going to depend on very much on your local community, dependent on very much on your local state. Um, and so what can and cannot be done right now is just, you're going to have to do a little bit of digging to figure out like if courts are even open um, and, and whether or not they'll even allow people to come in. So a lot of it is just, at the end of the day, it's, it's holding not only yourself accountable, but holding the system accountable for um, wrapping people in the system, especially during crisis. So, and you'll see in there, like we provided in there um, some general court support tips. Um, that first link is um, just tips on, how do you show up during the day? What time do you show up? Having patience um, during the day, um, because this is going to be—it's going to be a very long process. You may be there for five minutes. You may there. Be, you may be there for an hour. You might be there all day because it, it's really going to depend on the docket. Um, and the docket is the list of people who will be going through that courtroom that day. Um, and you'll see in there that it's it'll be helpful to wear an identifying marker so that person who you're showing up for knows you. If you are not a well acquainted if you're not well acquainted with that person. So for instance, for like this court support stuff here, this is based on our chapters who are showing up for our members. Um, and so that chapter member may not know that person in a personal relationship. So this just lets that person know that, hey, I'm with Black and Pink um, and I'm here to support you. So that it's very clear. Um, also, a lot of courts are gonna have rules and restrictions on what you can and cannot wear and what you can and cannot wear, uh, bring into the courts to make sure that's brought up. Andrew will talk um, a little bit more about you know, the experiences with court support a little bit. So I don't want to step too much on Andrew's toes. Um, and it's just, and also just be aware that it will probably be a very boring day. You'll hear a lot of legal jar jargon. You'll hear a lot of things that probably will not make sense to you. And that's okay. Um, what matters is that you're there to support somebody. What matters is, is that that person feels like they're not alone in the process. You know, and Andrew and I touched a little bit more on, on personal experiences. Myself, um, I'll touch more on you know, being somebody who's formerly incarcerated and what the, navigating that space looked like for me with not having very many supports as I navigated that. Um, there's also a training document in here. Um, and this is um, from our, again, from our Boston Black and Pink chapter. And it just provides kind of a, a general understanding of how they walk people through the process of court support. Um, and it also talks um, just in general, like gives some just general tips and tricks for walking through the system, navigating the court, um, key players in the courtroom so you can understand who is and is not in the room. Um, there's some keywords and concepts in there. So like arraignment, which is the court date when you find out what the charges are, which is gonna be completely different from a pre-trial hearing, which is court um, dates that are after the arraignment before the trial date, um, plea deals. And there's, and there's even, even within plea deals, there's a number of different plea deals, whether they're Alfred pleas or whether they're guilty pleas. Um, Albert, please uh, essentially say that, yes, there's enough evidence to convict me and find me guilty, but I'm also not saying that I am guilty. Um, so there's that piece. Um, 
And then also the third piece on court support is also working with people who are court involved. Um, and so when we're talking about people who are court involved, these are people, uh, these are just tips and tricks for the person who you're there to support and the person who you're there to affirm. Um, it's talking a lot about just best approaches, like making sure you're non-judgmental, um, checking your own privilege and checking your own goals at the door. Um, because this process is not about you. This process is about the person who is going through a very difficult time, a very scary time, and may not um, know exactly what they need or how they might want to navigate this. So, um, and, and also it's preparing you to know this may be a very slow process. It may be a very lengthy process that happens over a series of months. Um, and what that ongoing support looks like outside of the court too, because if, if they're going from an arraignment to a pretrial hearing to a trial, that's gonna be over a series of months and it's not gonna be on consecutive days. So in that gray space and in that in between, how do you show up for that person? Um, whether that's, you know, being a lifeline for them. So this is also making sure that you understand like how much you can give of yourself because this is a very, um, very draining experience for all people all around. So it's making sure that you can also hold yourself um, with care and hold and holding that and holding what you can and cannot offer to that person and making sure those boundaries are very clear um, from the get go. Um, it talks a lot about just the process in general. Um, so that is just on uh, court support. So court watching is a separate process and court watching is when people go in and they pretty much audit the courtroom. They, so they see, you know, what kind of biases are showing up in the court, how are court, or how are court actors um, such as judges, prosecutors, public defenders, as I mentioned before, possibly bailiffs, um, social workers, how are they all um, interacting with the person who is going through um, the system? Um, and there's a really good resource in there from Survived and Punish, which is an organization um, founded by the wonderful Miriam Kaba in New York City. And they talk a lot about how to start your own court watch process. So that's a good um, thing there. Um, and that's pretty much just all the resources. I don't want to take up too much time walking through those because those are there and you can take them at your own leisure. I wanted to, you know, spend a lot more time talking, you know, just about personal experiences as we're going through this. And then also opening up the floor um, for your questions and answers and making sure that we can hold space for you um, while you join us today. So Andrew, you wanna go ahead from there? Love to. Um, first I'd invite, I'm a social worker, um, therapist and uh, is my background and training. So um, I speak like one. So I would love for us all to just take a collective deep breath because <laughs> that was a lot. For some of us, that may have been the first intentional deep breath we've taken today. So um, I try to uh, take moments when I can. Um, so something that I think is really important for us to think about, um, and David already mentioned it, is when we're talking about both uh, court support or we're talking about court watch, um, at the end of the day, it's not about us. And so always remembering that because remember we enter in a space very differently um, when we're only focused on what we think is okay or, or what we think we should be paying attention to. Um, whereas when we enter into these spaces, we should just be paying attention in general what's happening. So some general tips that um, I would love for you to think about is um, first of all, coming with something to write on um, and how the court responds to that typically will depend on the judge. Um, some judges, um, it makes them nervous um, or they have questions about it. Some don't even really care, don't even notice it. Um, but in general, just bring something to write on um, just to be able to jot down little notes here and there um, as you are capturing information. Um, when we're providing court support, it may, the front end of that is we may have been contacted by somebody that says, hey, um, here's an individual that just needs a person. Um, they have, you know, a lawyer and, and, and whatnot, but they just need somebody in the room with them um, that they know is on their side. And so sometimes it's just that, um, but I still like to just take some notes um, and specifically of like dates that are mentioned. Um, also, uh, usually 
in courtrooms, things move really fast. Um, if you've never been in one before, they will, um, you know, throw out docket numbers and and this and that, and and they use a lot of language that you may not know. And so usually I'll jot down a word. If I'm like, I don't even know what that is, and I will go back to it later. Um, Another thing that I really encourage folks to think about is using your resources. So a lot of my experience with court support um, or even court watch, um, I usually say observation, so that's why I'm having to think of my words, but um, of court watch is within the youth system. And um, my background, I have a lot of work that I've done um, within the child welfare system or just in, in general of, of youth serving organizations, I should say. Um, I've never really worked in the system, but um, I know that I have those connections. And so I can ask questions of, um, can you tell me what, um, you know, this judge typically, how this judge usually reacts to people observing court? Or, you know, can you tell me um, what's the name of that judge's bailiff? Um, because usually the bailiffs are, um, at least I will speak to specifically in Omaha, um, in Douglas County, when uh, you go to the youth court, the bailiff is who will come get you um, and bring you to the courtroom. And so you kind of um, end up making friends with the bailiff um, so that if the bailiff is happy, usually the judge is happy. Um, and so you just learn these little things here and there. Um, also remember, in most situations, uh, observing court um, is, it's allowed. They'll act like it's a huge inconvenience, um, but you actually have the right to be in there. Um, anybody really could just come in and sit in it unless it's closed um, for a very specific reason, which is pretty rare. Um, however, there's a lot of different rules around right now with COVID. So it may be in your best interest to reach out to contacts that you have, or um, even try to get in, in contact with the court that you may end up doing observations or court support in, and just asking them what that process would look like if you are providing some court support for somebody, because um, it may look different in whatever district or whatever state or city that you are in currently. So that's something that I think about. The last tip that I um, think is really important that I do myself is after I get back, after I get done um, and I get somewhere that I can just be alone, I will um, like record myself just talking about these were my feelings in the courtroom. These are things that I kind of noticed. Here's some of the notes that I had um, because I have found and this is my therapist training that I will take notes shorthand. And then later I may look back and be like, oh shoot, what was that? And then also I like to capture like, what was the feeling in the courtroom? What was the power dynamic like? Um, Cause I think that's, that's really good information as you start to learn how different judges move and how different judges navigate their courtrooms. Cause that can help with future court support, help with future court observations or, or watch. Um, so those are like, that's the long game type stuff, but um, that's, that's something that I have utilized in, in the past for myself. Um, it can be really overwhelming to sit in a courtroom and watch um, I'm gonna say people be pretty dismissive um, or unattentive to somebody's life or um, it feels like maybe they're not taking something seriously, which um, is scary because you're like, you're the judge or, you know, you're people, even the defense attorneys, you're people that should have this person's side and it can feel overwhelming. Um, so just know that going in and, and think about what is your self-care plan? Who can you touch base with afterward? Um, and then think about how can you have that conversation with the person that you're there to help support. Um, and usually you may have to work with um, even maybe the defense attorney or somebody to even get connected to the individual or the family member, whoever you're working with, however you got 
attached to the situation to be able to provide that support um, is, is some things that you may think about in that reference. Um, yeah, do you want, uh, David, do you want to flip to some of your experiences and then I can flip back to um, some things that I have seen? Sure thing, yeah. As well. And um, I do want to put out a caveat for people. I have not talked about my experience navigating the court system. So I may be processing this um, a little bit as I'm talking through this, but I think that this is important. So I am I am more than happy to put that lived experience out there. I just, and I'm probably asking for a little bit of space. So if I catch my breath or something um, for a moment, um, just bear with me. Um, Cause this like my incarceration experiences was very, um, it was very traumatizing for me, as it is for a lot of people. Um, and I think that when you're dealing with the court system, the first thing that you can say is, uh, well, the first thing I would ask people is to, you know, make uh, understand what you're what you're getting into and understand, you know, kind of what your boundaries are. Like, you don't need to know your boundaries first off, but make sure that you can commit to the boundaries that you do. And if you can't commit, be willing to engage in a conversation with that person that you are supporting and say, hey, um, I've hit the limit that I can, you know, and try and maybe try and work with them to see if there's somebody else who can support them because taking that support away after they've been supportive can be really hard on somebody. Um, and also I think the other key piece is also to, you, you may not always know, especially if this person is somebody who you are not friends with or somebody that you are not acquainted with or, you know, that you're not involved with in the community. This may be somebody who is just, you know, quote unquote, a stranger to you. Um, and so you may not always know what's happening in their lives at that point. Um, and to give you an idea, so when I was going through when I was going through the system myself, I was navigating coming out. I was navigating going to college. I was navigating trying to reconcile with my parents. There's a lot of there's a lot of stresses that were going on around me on, on the outside world um, and things that I couldn't give to people. And you know, during my entire, like until I actually got to the trial piece of um, my system experience there wasn't anybody to really provide any support or really any guidance. And I think that was very, that was very harmful for a number of reasons. Um, but then when we got to the trial um, experience, um, right before I was, you know, incarcerated, both my parents passed away. Um, and so I was navigating this, like I was navigating this very huge um, trauma as I was going through this and the bottom literally just fell out for me. And right the day before I was going into the courtroom, my now ex had decided to, you know, you know, do a line of coke in the bathroom. Um, and so the next morning they couldn't support me. So when I showed up in the courtroom, um, my brother-in-law and my sister were there, but this is the first time I'd seen them throughout their process. I couldn't really rely on them for support because they didn't understand what I was going through. Um, I didn't have my, the support of my community either. And a lot of it is just, for somebody to have been supportive would have changed the game for me. It would have, it would have made me feel less alone and um, it felt made me feel more supportive and, and let me know that there were people there for me. So I think the key piece is just to make sure that you're, you engage in communication along the way. Let that person know that you are supporting, um, that you're there for them and that you support them and making sure that those boundaries are you know, clearly communicated. And it's not even just in the court process too. As I said before, in those gray spaces, between like arraignment, between trial, um, perhaps they've gone to jail um, and before they were bonded out, like what does that look like? Um, because those different stages can be very stressful um, and the stress level is gonna change from time to time too, um, especially because there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with navigating the system and it's very scary, it's very terrifying. Um, and so it just, I think just in general, just holding space, communicating, knowing your boundaries, um, and just providing support as they go. Like, I think just in general, just having compassion. And, you know, and I also want to make sure that don't, I would say also don't try and look up the crime they've convicted of too, because then that puts, then that colors your interaction with that person. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable with it, you don't feel comfortable with it and that's okay. But also try not to, you know, see what what their crime was, because you again, you don't know that situation that led to that crime in the first place, and how and how crimes are charged is vastly different. And so they may have been they, one action may have been um, one action may have been charged, but that is also at the discretion of either the prosecutor or the cop who's done it. So 
you know, even just understanding what exactly happened in that situation, you're never really going to know. Um, and you're never going to really know both sides of it. So just making sure that you come in with the, interrogate your growth and interrogate your understanding. I think those are the, those are the other key pieces for that. Um, yeah, and David, thank you for sharing those pieces with us. Um, we obviously do not uh, have to hear that and we are very thankful um, for you sharing that. Um, I think with that piece, uh, Sometimes uh, just letting folks know, just letting folks know that it's okay to not understand all the language or it's okay to say um, that I'm scared, I don't know what's happening. Um, I always like to ask people what, you know, who are their support systems? Um, what, does, what does support look like to them? Anytime I'm working with somebody in any type of capacity, I always ask them, what does support look like to you? Um, because support looks different for me than it does for Nikki, than it does with David, uh, because we all have different experiences and are navigating different situations and just support looks different. And so that's something that's really important, once again, because it's not about us. Um, something that has been mentioned earlier, but I just really want to highlight it again. We are not giving legal advice. That is not the role of either um, court support or observation, we're not there to, um, you know, disrupt the court in, in, in that moment, right? Uh, obviously, as um, an abolitionist organization, Black and Pink definitely looks at what are ways that we can handle these situations outside of a courtroom. Um, but what we know is that the system's set up in a certain way where that is just not the case for everybody right now. And so, we have to figure out what it looks like to, to move and navigate within those spaces. And it is not helpful to somebody that we are um, there to support um, to cause any type of disruption during that situation because actually then that comes back on them um, and can impact the outcome of their situation. So really thinking about those pieces, there's other ways for us to um, tackle those sort of issues and and I think that can be discussed at a, a later time. Um, also, you know, um, voting and things like that, but that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation. Um, and then uh, I think also figuring out what does the follow-up piece look like? So if, if you're working with somebody that you feel like has some ongoing um, support that's needed outside of just being there for them um, in that situation in the courtroom um, and you don't have the resources maybe at the organization you're with or within your community please feel free to connect uh, them to Black and Pink or, or send their information to Black and Pink. I put uh, the case management at blackandpink.org um, email also in the comments for everybody um, because um, you know that's an easy way for us to be able to get people connected and I, I actually do have a form that people could fill out um, that I should have posted but I didn't um, and so that can be if somebody needs that ongoing support uh, maybe they ended up getting uh, you know jail or prison time and so that's something that we want to make sure that we can provide ongoing support for people inside or maybe they um, are back in the community but need to figure out what that support looks like. So I don't want people to think like, oh, okay, because I went into this um, courtroom to help provide courtroom support. Now I am responsible for assisting this individual through everything they have to navigate. Um, there's a lot of different supports in different communities, and that's something that we can definitely help with. Um, this is more about that in the moment type support. Um, so I think those are some of the big high level things. We obviously could go more in depth into some of the pieces that are within the toolkit, but before we decide to go that direction, um, I would love for us to kind of open up for some questions. So as people are thinking about what they wanna ask, um, please start to put them in the question and answer space. Um, 
something that I have seen in courtrooms, um, once again, I want you to think about the power dynamic, um, especially when we think about court involving youth, is that oftentimes the youth's voice is not heard or there's not an opportunity provided for them to be able to say anything other than like, yes, your honor, no, your honor. Um, and so sometimes it may be just asking them that piece and then sharing that with their defense attorney or whoever is, is part of their team of just saying, hey, this is something that they asked me to share with you. So um, those are some other ways that I have had to provide some support or, or help speak up for somebody who is um, a, a youth um, within that within the system. Um, and then earlier we, it was brought up um, that there are all sorts of different people that may be involved with youth, whether that's like CASA workers or, um, you know, if they're on probation, there, there may be folks from probation and there may be people, um, obviously their attorneys, their, um, if they're, a, a state ward, um, if they're involved in child welfare system, then there's all sorts of other folks. Um, so there may be a lot of different people that have probably never met that young person before. And sometimes they may have just met them literally in the courtroom at that moment. Um, and so even writing down names and where people are from as they're starting to um, as they're starting to, to share that in the courtroom, it can be helpful information to be able to share uh, with the young person in the future as well. Um, so I would love for us to go to some questions, unless you have something, David, that you would like. No, um, I think I, I just appreciate for y'all for walking in here with us and like, you know, creating space for us to share this and to share information and knowledge with y'all. Um, I appreciate it. Um, we do have a couple questions already. Um, in the Q&A, so I appreciate y'all. So Rachel, thank you for your good question on like, are there any neighborhood specific groups or resources for court support? Um, one, I would check to see if there's a black and pink chapter in your area, first and foremost, because a lot of our chapters do um, provide court support. Um, the other recommendation I would have is to check with your local, like either prison abolition or criminal justice grassroots organizations in an area. Um, and if they don't provide it or don't have resources, they should know somebody that they can go to. Um, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Um, let's see. No, I mean, I think, sorry, you may have said this. Um, I was reading in the same, same time, but there are, you know, if there's any type of um, social justice, like grassroots organizations in your area, a lot of times they are, especially led by people of color, um, a lot of times this is something that they have had to navigate or at least have connections to folks that are doing this work in the community. And so that, may also be a way of offering that help and support if there's not um, a black and pink chapter in, in your area. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see, so Cameron asked, do you know whether COVID restrictions are different on a county by county, judge by judge, or a case by case basis? Andrew, do you wanna tackle this? You want me to um, provide some guidance? I can start and then you can kind of jump in. So it really right now is depending on, um, like state, city, county. Um, you know, different courtrooms are doing different things. So some some states have moved to more virtual type options. Um, some states aren't doing that at all. Some states are delaying um, hearings uh, as much as they can to try to keep it out of the courtroom. Um, some are only allowing certain folks to be in there. And so it really depends on what are uh, what are the provisions that have been allowed. Um, by that county, state, uh, county, city, and state. Um, and so I, I would encourage, A, if you have a connection to somebody that navigates or works in the courtrooms more often, whether that's like a caseworker or, or somebody that works within the, court, um, the courthouse, maybe asking them how that looks. Um, you know, you can call up sometimes and just ask straight up, you know, I'm, I'm providing uh, some support for, I'm d providing some courtroom support, and I was wondering what the check-in process looks like, um, but I typically will do both, because that's just, um, I like all the information, so I will usually call up, get that information, and then I'll ask some people that I know, and be like, this is what I was told, is that 
what's really happening. So it, it's kind of a case by case. I haven't heard it as much um, judge by judge as far as like COVID specific stuff. Um, but I will say the courtroom experience in general will absolutely be different um, from courtroom to courtroom based on the judge. That's just in general. Um, the judge kind of sets the tone for the room and the energy for the room, um, and, and it will look completely different. You could have the same situation in front of two different judges, and um, just the feel of it, it is typically different. Right. And I think, too, with co like the COVID restrictions, I would, either, I would check their website, like the court website, to see um, whether the courtrooms are even open. Um, that's also the place where you can often check the dockets, too, sometimes. Um, Website tree is a good thing. Calling them up um, is also a good thing, but really you're just gonna check and see what it looks like in your county um, or your municipality or whatever it is um, for that moment. Because right now I couldn't tell you um, just based on the, um, the lockdown orders, the stay at home restrictions. Um, I mean, even right now with the curfew restrictions, like things are changing almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So I couldn't, I couldn't advise you you know, specifically, but I can just say, you know, more generally, more broadly, just check out the county website, check out the county website, check out the city website, um, and see what's happening there. Great. Um, how do I get involved with, oh, go ahead. how do I get involved with court support or court watch locally? I don't know where to start with reaching people who could use the help. Um, so kind of two different pieces there. The first piece is I would say if you have a local black and pink chapter, um, that would be a good start. If not, um, I would say, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but you could, you could reach out to the black and pink um, national um, to one of us and we can either uh, get you connected to somebody that we know is doing court support in that area or um, if there really isn't um, that we're aware of, we can help navigate what it looks like to, to build that infrastructure and um, begin that type of support. Because we do want to make sure, what I don't want to have happen is that there's just a bunch of people that just like show up for court and don't feel like they um, are prepared or um, don't feel like they have any type of support as they're navigating that as well. Right. Um, the second part, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, you're good. The second part of that question, oh, um, the where to start with reaching people who could use the help. Um, you know, that's the hard part. Uh, I think first it is um, getting that out to your networks and just letting them know that, um, like for example, we've been when letting people know nationally um, that we can, you know, Black and Pink can help with court support and we have different folks in different areas throughout the United States that could assist with court support. So it's letting your networks know, um, you know, we specifically are working with LGBTQ plus individuals as an organization. So making sure we're reaching out to some of the on the ground LGBTQ organizations that are working with folks who um, are system impacted or um, are, are navigating um, some of those uh, barriers. And, um, and I think also when you are, let's say there's somebody you got connected to, you know when their court date is, you haven't met them yet though. Um, it kind of depends on your specific uh, courthouse and what their process looks like. For um, the juvenile court, for example, here, or the youth, uh, youth court system here in Omaha, um, it's kind of in a small waiting room where people are. And so I will typically just ask like, hi, are you, are you so-and-so? Or I'll, I'll kind of figure out if, if that person's there and just introduce myself and say, this is you know, who I am. Um, I'm here to provide support for you. Um, I, I will just be sitting you know, in, the, in the back because you won't be able to sit up there with them. So you'll be sitting um, in you know, typically the like bleacher or um, what, what is the word I'm looking for? Not bleachers. <laughs> um, like pews is yeah, like kind of what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, but you're usually sitting um, behind and then you just let them know, like I'm, I'll be looking 
you know, I'll just be collecting information just so that I can, you know, pass it on to you. Um, is there, is there another way that you think I could be of support in this room? And then you can let them know, yes, I can do that or no, I can't do that. Um, and if they're like, I actually don't want you there. I'm cool. I don't need you. Then that's, you know, their, um, prerogative and, and you just, uh, kind of back away at that point and let them have that space. Um, so I think that that's what I would say as far as, as those two questions. I don't know if you have something to add. Yeah, I have some stuff to add. Before I do, we had somebody who asked for like just a brief explanation of court support again. So before I answer, I wanted oh, to okay. know the people who came in late. Um, court support, well, we've been talking about court support and court watching. Um, and so these things, uh, these are like advocacy tools in our toolkit um, to allow us to care for our system impacted community members by providing either individual case support, um, attempting to ensure a more transparent legal system, um, reporting on courtroom actors and the kind of biases and the things they hold, um, gathering information on the process in the courtroom, um, and also attempting just to more to guarantee more policy implementation on how to make um, courtrooms more inclusive and more affirming. Um, but back to Vincent's question about getting involved, um, I'm going to put a note in the um, chat. There's this other thing called participatory, participatory defense, um, which I did not talk about, which is basically um, it's a it's, it's a certification so you can learn how to do court support. Um, there's an entire website devoted to it. It's I will actually put this in the toolkit as well. It was something that was on my mind yesterday and I forgot to put it in there. So I apologize for that. That will get in there today. Um, but also um, survived and punished. We have that very great resource on survived and punished um, in the toolkit about um, how to start your own court watch. Um, and I think too, like to uh, Andrew's piece, another thing you could do is just, you know, make yourself available as a resource, like on social media, um, maybe on, on Facebook, you know, if you, if you know, there's people um, that are looking for court support or something, just be like, look, if you are, you know, if you're protesting, you can get arrested, da, 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 um, and you have to go through the system, I'm available to do this, you know, DM me and we can chat a little bit more about what that process looks like. I think that'd be the best bet to find somebody. Perfect. Andrew, you want to take the next question? It's about when we take notes yes. in the courtroom, oh, yeah. does it make sense to share those notes with anyone, the person we're supporting, the organization we're with? Yeah, so I mean, I think you are, um, there is a support to that person. So I, I think that it is uh, good to um, get those notes to them. Um, how that looks will depend on that person's situation, whether that's directly to them, through a family member, um, through their legal team, um, you'll kind of know their situation a little better as you navigate with them. But I always think that that's helpful. Um, I think that as you're working with an organization doing uh, providing that support, um, it is also helpful to keep those somewhere so that um, let's say this person has ongoing um, hearings or, or needs ongoing court support and there's somebody else that goes instead of, of you um, that they can be able to review, this is what has happened in the past, or this is the type of support that we've provided in the past, um, just so that they can be familiar with the situation. Uh, so I, I think that in general, yes. Okay. Um, and then I don't have anything to add. I think that was a great, um, I think that was a great um, response to that. And then kind of the last question from Leah is, can you do court support digitally, um, other tasks for immunocompromised, unemployed, queer white folks right now? Absolutely, and I think this is a great question to ask um, because court support doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in the courtroom to show up for somebody. Um, and if it, and especially for right now during COVID where things are very uncertain um, and there's a lot of concerns around people who are immunocompromised, I hear you for that. Um, I am not somebody who's immunocompromised, so I don't have, I don't share those same concerns. Um, but I think this is a great question. Um, and I think right now, like supporting somebody digitally could look like having a Zoom meeting or having a phone call with somebody and let them know, hey, I'm here to provide support for you, what you need. And the other thing too, is that person may not know what they need. Maybe all they really need is just for you to show up for them and just have somebody to talk to um, and to just help them calm their fears. Um, even if that means just taking their mind off of it for you know an hour. Um, so yeah, there's ways to do things digitally. It's just being inventive about it. In ways I've supported people outside the courtroom as well is um, sometimes people, because of the power structures that just exist within the courtroom and just exist within the system um, and exist between you and your attorney and um, it just, 
it's if you've never been in a courtroom before, especially if you've never, you know, I think if you've been in the courtroom for your own situation, that feels one way. And if you've been in the courtroom to observe, um, it's really interesting to just like see all of the power dynamics and how they play out. Um, and so sometimes people feel fearful to speak up or they don't want to say something because they think that they'll sound stupid. Um, and so I've had folks who have said like, I really feel like my you know attorney's not hearing me and I don't know how to say this to them. Um, and it's not legal advice. It's just here's maybe some ways you could share that information. Or have you thought about writing it to them so that you can kind of pick your words, um, you know, things like that. So I've, I've helped people just kind of navigate how do I um, advocate for myself and how do I share where, where I am um, and how I'm feeling about this process. And we do have some questions in the chat as well. So I'll go over some of those. Um, so you can show up for core observation and put boundaries to what you can do um, within the courtroom and then does black and pink assign you. Um, so I'm gonna answer those backwards. It kind of depends on the chapter and how they navigate, navigate those pieces. Um, so I would say connect there. Amy, you can probably uh, connect with, with me and um, we can talk more about what that piece would look like to get you involved in that if you're interested. In general, for court watch um, slash observations, um, honestly, you, like, that's something that we can just do as um, people in the community. Um, and so I've shown up for, um, and once again, my experience is mostly with, with youth uh, specific courts. So, um, you can just show up and, um, say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to observe. And usually they'll ask you questions. I'll be like, okay, who are you here with? Um, and usually I just say like, I'm just a social worker in the community that's interested in, you know, learning more about how, um, the court system works is usually what I say. Um, but you can just, we, we're allowed to be there. Um, they may not get you and bring you back to the room. Um, it's something I've experienced a lot. So you kind of have to pay attention to what's happening. Um, and usually I ask that up front, will somebody come get me? Or how should I know that I can go into the courtroom? Um, but it kind of depends on, once again, your specific uh, courthouse or your specific uh, even judge and how that process is navigated. But usually there's somewhere to be able to like check in or there's usually somewhere to be able to touch base with somebody. Um, so you have that, let's see here. Sorry, I'm going through these chats here. Uh, Facebook question, uh, quick, oh, you already did that. Okay, I think. There's one from Megan down there, do you see that? Okay. If we're in Omaha, how do we sign up for court support? I would say um, for now, reach out to um, one of the two emails that I posted, whether it be myself personally, or uh, you can um, email the case management at blackandpink.org. Either of those two are fine, and we will get you connected. Perfect. Are there any other questions? I don't see any. Nikki, are there any on Facebook for us, love? All of these faces that I'm making. Um, oh, sorry. sorry, I was <laughs> trying to unmute myself with my finger on my laptop that is not a touch screen. Because <laughs> that's all life is right now. Um, no other questions on Facebook. Um, Liz just says that they have to hop on a call shortly, but thank you so much for this. It was very informative and helpful and easy to access. So that's amazing um, that it was kind of, you know, it's really nice to have a low, like a low point of entry, right? Like this doesn't have to be a high level thing. And so 
y'all are so awesome with that. Um, the only other thing uh, that I could think of is, because um, a lot of it was like, how do I get involved? How do I get involved? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I was thinking about was our pen pal program. Um, so I don't know if either of you want to just give a quick combo about that, or if it's like, nah, Nikki or Brock here, which is totally accurate. What I would say is that um, Black and Pink does have a pen pal program. Um, and there, uh, I think is a link still on our um, new website. We're currently in the process of um, figuring out what is the, the best point of connection um, and how to best pair folks together. Um, but that does still exist. And uh, pen pal is, is always an option as, as a way of support for um, especially our you know, inside members. And, and so that, I think that's huge. Um, so yes, thank you for mentioning that. Also, you mentioned the low point of, uh, or like the easy point of entry with like low responsibility. Um, what people don't always realize is that the court watch and court observations are so important. Um, and some folks may seem like I'm just sitting here. I'm literally just sitting here watching a couple different like dockets go by. Um, but it helps uh, people in your community know what do different judges courtrooms look like? How do they move? How do they navigate? Um, how do they give voice to those that are actually impacted in their courtroom? How do they respond to, to people even observing their courtroom? Um, also, it's really interesting, like in between like dockets or cases, like the um, people in the courtroom will just have like open conversation with each other. Um, and I always find that really interesting. And I don't obviously like take big notes on it, but I'll like jot down like a word or two that I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like, because um, it helps you just understand like, what is the dynamic? What is the dynamic of people that work together in that setting? So there's just so much that's happening in a courtroom that people don't, both before, after, during, that people don't always get to see. So collecting that information actually helps us be able to provide court support because we may not have been in this courtroom before, but we have three people that observed in this courtroom. So we know how this judge kind of moves. Um, they've been consistent, or we know that, um, you know, something bothers them. They don't like it when people are tied to an organization because um, a judge technically can ask you to leave the courtroom. Um, I haven't had it happen to me, but um, it, they technically could. And so, um, you know, I, I think it, it's helpful for us to know like what to expect and what we can help the folks that we're helping navigate this space. Um, you know, they really like to hear from you. They really like to hear you say, um, you know, yes, Your Honor, or they really, this, this judge, you know, doesn't always allow um, young folks to speak so much. So you may wanna make sure that you really you know, tell your attorney like how you feel about stuff, like really be upfront with them because um, you, you may or may not get an opportunity. And so those sort of things help us get that information and just understand what these different courtrooms feel like and look like and uh, how we can navigate them. Right. And so before we take our leave, um, I do want to just, you know, refresh, like one of the more common themes that's gonna show up in this toolkit is yes, you can advocate and yes, you can, you can stand in solidarity for us, but also in the same breath, you have to decenter yourself and decenter your privilege. Um, well, yeah, and decenter yourself in this conversation and make sure you make space for the person who is most impacted um, to have a say in what happens and to have a say in how this process goes um, because the person who's most impacted is going to know how they want this process to go and just trust, the, trust their needs, trust their experience, trust that they know what's best for them. Um, so yes. Um, but yeah, and I think that's just the end of this. I do want to say thank you so much um, for showing up in solidarity today um, for this first one. I appreciate you. And Andrea's one last thing. 
I realize that I keep saying uh, the emails are in the chat, but the people on Facebook don't get the privilege of that. Um, so uh, I said that my email was andrew at blackandpink.org. And for just general um, support services, I prefer that people email case management at blackandpink.org, um, but either are fine. Um, and I don't know if anybody else wants to share there. Yeah, and mine is david at blackandpink.org. Um, I pretty much handle a lot of different things in black and pink. So in general, if you have a question about the organization or anything, um, that's I, I pretty much am like the catch all. So just send um, your questions to me if you have them. And just a warning, I get a lot of emails, so I may be like a day or two behind, um, but I will respond a week at most is the lo as long as you'll have to wait for me. Um, but yeah, I appreciate y'all again for showing up today. Thank you. Um, I, as that is, thank you both, both, both so, so, so much um, for sharing your experience and your expertise. Um, um, I feel so fortunate and grateful and humbled every day that I get to work with y'all and uh, the rest of our staff and how awesome everybody is. Um, I just, the one of the questions that I've been getting a lot is, is this being recorded? Will there be a playback? All of that stuff. So yes, yes, yes. Um, so I can't say I didn't say that. No, you can't. I mean, it, well, you can just let me know so I can edit it out before I post it on YouTube tomorrow. <laughs> um, please share. We want as much of this information out into the public as possible. So yes, please share. That's it. Thank you, y'all. Thank you.